The Liberal Party has never been very good at honouring its own. Its founder, Robert Menzies aside, and John Howard, but really only in recent times, the right side of politics has always been eclipsed by the left with their creation of heroes and myth-making. It's one of the reasons, sadly, why Labor has so often set the tone for Australia's political narrative, even though in modern times it's been the Liberal Party that more often than not have held power. Take Gough Whitlam, for instance, a poor Prime Minister who Labor has lionised to this day as the person who supposedly brought Australia into the modern world. Take Paul Keating, a good Treasurer under Hawke, but another poor Prime Minister who needlessly divided Australia, yet Labor ignores his economic legacy while prosecuting and celebrating the culture wars he started, culture wars that continue to this day. As Conservatives, we often wrongly think that people will remember the truth. But that's hard when Labor does its level best to write and rewrite history so that with the passage of time, it's their version of events that stand uncontested and the many achievements of the Liberal movement often go missing. I'm pleased to say that after last night, a dinner to honour Tony Abbott's 25 years of public service, I think the Liberals are finally learning they have to create heroes of their own and write their own narrative if they're to own their place in history against the revisionism of the left. Last night, more than 1,100 people with a waiting list of 400 plus, along with plenty of Liberal heavyweights, turned up at the biggest Liberal gathering in years to honour Australia's 28th Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, and his family. Abbott might have only had the top job for two years, but there would never have been a Morrison government or indeed a Turnbull one if Abbott hadn't got the Liberals back into government in record time and given them an electoral buffer to survive the self-inflicted wounds and poor campaigning of 2016. Abbott is widely acknowledged as a superb opposition leader, even begrudgingly by the professional Abbott haters, but last night he was celebrated as a fine Prime Minister too, whose time was cut short at the top job. The reality of the Abbott leadership is that forces within the then shadow cabinet and subsequently cabinet undermined his position from day one. History records many of the same forces unleashed to also bring down Brendan Nelson. But the truth is that many of the same people attempted to do the same to the Morrison Prime Ministership. Fortunately, our success in May has left those people in our wake and our party is much stronger for it. Time has exposed Abbott's successor for what he was and his epitaph, at least in the eyes of the Liberal Party faithful, will be the manner in which he departed office and his behaviour and that of his son during the Wentworth by-election. By contrast, that same Liberal Party base turned out in great number to honour Tony Abbott's life and service and his achievements in office as a true son of the Liberal movement. And significant achievements they were. There's no doubt that stopping the illegal immigrant boats was historic. There's been no other country that's done it then or since, which is why I fight here most nights against any weakening of Australia's policies in the border protection area, lest the people smugglers restart their trade. But that wasn't it. Scrapping unjust and counterproductive taxes by getting rid of the carbon tax and the mining tax, Abbott got it done. Then there were the big three trade deals. China, Japan and Korea representing 50% of Australia's overall export trade deals that had been stuck in interminable negotiations for over 10 years. And an infrastructure boom too, including the Western Sydney Airport that governments had dithered over for half a century. Sure, the 2014 budget's big economic reforms were sabotaged in the Senate, but it was the start of the careful housekeeping that's finally delivered the first surplus in more than a decade. None of this happened because Abbott was good at politics, although that he was. It happened because he had conviction about the things that mattered to our country and how to practically make them happen. I worked for seven cabinet ministers in my time in politics and Abbott was never just another go with the flow 
politician. He was a warrior, prepared to put his head above the parapet and say what needed to be said, however unpopular that might have been, about the climate cult in particular and about political correctness in general. How many MPs have been prepared, as Abbott was, to volunteer in the local fire brigade or surf club and to spend serious time in remote Australia rather than just pontificate on issues of reconciliation and to raise private money for good causes, like everyone else does in their own local communities, rather than like most MPs who just love to throw around public money to strike a pose. And when it comes to character, how many MPs say what's needed on the record, as Abbott did, rather than leak and brief anonymously? It was interesting last night. I counted at least four MPs there who had voted for Turnbull in the 20. 15 spill. Perhaps it was their way of saying sorry. Maybe it's just another good sign that the worst of political treachery is now behind us as a nation. I've been there in politics and now I'm here in the media. And if politicians spent as much time building up our country as they spend trying to tear each other down via anonymous sources or off the record discussions, well, Australia would be far better for it. And, I might add, if lazy journalists spent the time their predecessors once did in drilling into the detail of policy and keeping politicians on their toes rather than focused on internal gossip, we'd have better outcomes for real people. That I have no doubt. As the Labor Party continues its soul-searching after losing the unlosable election, Last night it seemed that the Liberal Party might just have found its soul again.